Now, as we recognize Youth Month uh, 30 years into democracy, education continues to be a serious issue when it comes to young people in the country. From financial challenges to simple access to education, fathers, the need to continue finding ways to bridge the education gap continues to exist. Fahai to Dumelang Nakitabo Malukwane, welcome to this edition of Sowet Today. Tonight we look at uh, the education in South Africa with a focus on programs and initiatives that seek to bridge the gap to access to education as well as uh, equip young people with skills that will increase their chances at employability after school. Now joining us in studio to kickstart the conversation is Ntato Silibi, who is the Executive Director of the South African Actuarial Development Program. He joins us to let us know about uh, the organization and the program in its entirety. Uh, Mr. Silibi, much appreciated for joining us. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us and uh, truly appreciate it. Much appreciated. I mean, uh, let's maybe start the conversation by, uh, you know, understanding what um, uh, the South African Actuarial Development Program is and what is it that you do for the youth and, um, you know, their education. SADP, uh, short for the South African Actuarial yeah. Development Program, is a program that was started uh, 20 years ago with the sole intention of growing the number of black African actuaries in the country. In 2003, when an assessment was done in terms of members of the Actuarial Society of South Africa, it was only discovered that there was only one black African yeah. in 2003. So we're not talking that long ago. And as such, this program was established to try and turn the tide in that respect, to make sure that we grow the number of black um, actuaries in the country, uh, to obviously have an impact as far as that profession is concerned and to also make sure that uh, uh, youngsters are provided with the opportunities to look at careers that are a little bit more than just what we would know of, you know, being a doctor, yeah. being a teacher, etc. And that's literally what we do. We provide support to students in the form of bursaries, uh, in, in, in the form of uh, academic support to ensure that they are able to be successful um, actuaries at the end. I mean, I, I want us to bring it back to the communities for, in, in yeah. layman's term, for people that do not understand what uh, actuaries are. I mean, yeah. I remember my younger sister uh, back then uh, told my parents that he was going, I mean, she was going to study um, actuarial sciences. And I mean, most of us, we are confused in the house. Yeah. Maybe let's bring it, uh, what are, uh, you know, actuaries, if, if, if maybe we can just break it down. Tabo, you're challenging me when you say bring it down, because yeah. I don't understand how far down you want me <laughs> to bring it. But nonetheless, the, 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 the most basic way I try to describe being an actuary or what an actuary is, is the following. They are people who are very much concerned about risk. Yeah. They try to look into the future by using data, by using numbers, by using formulas, by using models, they try to ascertain or determine the likelihood of something happening in the future and therefore be able to build and do things to mitigate or to counter whatever that occurrence is. For yeah. instance, you drive a car, I drive a car. There is an actuary who sits there and determines. Ntato lives in Centurion, Tabo lives in Soweto. What are the likelihood that Ntato is going to be in an accident in the next three months? What's the likelihood Tabo is going to be in an accident in the next three months? By looking at the accident rates reported, by looking at all sorts of things. Yeah. They then work with their formulas and their models and they, they assess how much your premium should be and how much my premium should be. So they are the people in the background who are doing that kind of modeling. And that kind of modeling is no longer just in insurance, which is where it predominates, but it's starting to show its um, strength in banking and in commerce in general. Mm. Um, okay, now let's talk about the student pipeline uh, development program there. Yeah. Uh, what exactly is it and how, you know, will it assist, you know, young people in equipping them uh, with the necessary skills to work in the sector? I, I would say our pipeline development program is almost three-pronged. Uh, Two-pronged, definitely, but almost three-pronged. The first one is being in, in, in programs such as yours. To, to disseminate information to say there is something called actuarial science. There are people who are called actuaries. Know about them. They're very important to your life. They're very important to our communities. 
you want to be one because you want to make sure you, you play a part in the growth and, and the development of this country. The second aspect is being able to go out to schools uh, and create that kind of awareness and that kind of interest for students to want to apply. How do you apply? Mm. Where do you apply? What do you need in order to apply? And, and that becomes part of it. And then the third part is exposure. It's one thing to hear about it, but you need to also be exposed. Meet an actuary, uh, have conversation with an actuary, spend a day in an environment where actuaries work so that you can then learn. So that holistically is our pipeline development program so that people not only know about it, but as youngsters, they get an, ex an opportunity to be mentored, an opportunity to meet an actuary, to meet actuarial science students, and, and to be able to mm -hmm. then make an informed decision about whether they want to follow this career path or not. I mean, you touched on various things. There. I mean, you also touched on uh, the fact that, uh, you know, w we haven't had uh, as many uh, uh, African actuaries as you, you, we started the conversation there. But in terms of employability, uh, and uh, just employment opportunities. Obviously, this must be difficult as, uh, you know, many people still, uh, as you're saying, we need to create more awareness about it so that people can understand that actually actuaries do exist. Yeah, yeah and, and the challenge for us at the moment is the fact that there's a shortage worldwide. So if there's a sh shortage worldwide, uh, obviously we also have a, sh a shortage. Yeah. And therefore our skills are being <laughs> exported because other countries pay better in, in dollars and in pounds, etc. Uh, but it, employability, this is one career that I know of where there's zero unemployment. Yeah. Even a student who graduates with an actuarial science degree is employable because those skills are needed. And that's part of the challenge at times in trying to get them to, to qualifying as actuaries, uh, not just have a degree in actuarial sciences because uh, companies and, and, and uh, corporates, they, 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 they swoop them up as soon as they get a degree and they employ them and, and they promote them within, which then takes away time from the other things. So, so for us, employability is number one. And we are now working very hard to make sure that uh, our graduates are not just uh, good technically, yeah. but they are well-rounded people. Their life skills, uh, abilities are, are at a high level so that they can cope. Silly, I wish we had more time so that we can be able to expand on this, but much appreciated uh, for coming in and uh, just sharing uh, light on uh, you know, actual sciences. Uh, you know, when people talk about it, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's really something that people would think that it, it doesn't exist, yeah. if I may put it that way, but much appreciated uh, for coming in. Thank you for having us. That was uh, the Executive Director at the South African Actuarial Science Development Programme Tanto Salibi speaking to us about how equipping young people with skills in actuarial science could assist them as far as employment after leaving school. We're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, we continue the conversation. Do stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Soweto Today. Much appreciated for joining us. Before the ad break, we started the conversation on youth and education through uh, taking a look at how equipping young people with actuarial science skills could assist them. Now we take a look at the initiative that uh, looks uh, to bridge a gap uh, to access uh, to education. Joining us via Zoom to have this conversation is Adrian Safi, the event director at uh, Quay Sky Run. He joins us now to let us know more about uh, uh, their projects and partnerships with EduNova and how it assists in educating young people. Adrian, much appreciated for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Tabu. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity. Much appreciated. I mean, let's start the conversation by maybe just telling us more about uh, both uh, Quay Sky Run and EduNova, as well as how you work together, uh, you know, to assist uh, in bridging the education gap. All right, so the KOA Skyrun is the oldest mountain ultra run in South Africa. This is our 28th year running it this year. Uh, 100 kilometer high altitude mountain run over the remote area in the Eastern Cape. Um, so it's 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 like the, one of the premier ultra running events. And um, Edunova, non-profit organization that tries to assist um, and um, less privileged communities and and rural communities with 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 educational tools especially in the information and communication technology department 
So we've partnered with them over the last six years, and now we've renewed our partnership for a further three years, um, whereby we we generate funds through our event uh, by allocating a certain amount of entries to Edgenova, which they then forward on sell, oh, sorry, sell on forward to 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 people, generating an income, and this income is then in turn used to um, to to support and to promote schools in the in the area that our run um, goes through um, mm. with 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 IT technology um, hardware programs um, just to help help the learners um, going forward with with um, mm. with information and communication technology in in these schools in the rural areas. Now, Adrian, I mean, how, you know, you've touched on various things that are very important there, the issues of IT and stuff, especially in uh, far-flung areas, I mean, rural areas. How do you go about identifying the underprivileged children that you assist in? Uh, are they, uh, you know, uh, as you mentioned, uh, from various areas, including rural areas, and also, um, uh, you know, are you currently focusing uh, 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 on, on, on other projects maybe in, in, in future so that you can expand the program itself? Well, for example, so, so the schools that, 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 that are in the area where we... Look, Edgenova is, nat is national, so they've, up to date, they've assisted over, over 70,000 learners um, in the 1,073 schools. That's nationally. But our race is in the Lady Grey area, the Wardrail district, the Barclay area. So we try and focus on the communities that our rates our rates reaches. So previously they had we had a project with the Lady Grey School of Arts, where we might certain um, I, um, ICT um, um, uh, hardware was was donated to the schools. There were follow up programs that Edgenova does with them, so that you can monitor and see. You know the progress made, and this this year we are we are looking at the the War Trail School. It's in a very remote district. There's not a massive amount of learners, but a lot of these schools don't have access to this type of technology, which is a very important part of the future. You know, um, the future is 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 um, in information and communication technology, and we give these children access through Edgenova to, to, to hardware, first of all, to, to monitorable programs, to, um, you know, to follow up, to, to help educate them so that, you know, that they, they have got a, a brighter future in this, in this field. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Adrian, I want us to talk about uh, the financial donations. I mean, you touched on uh, uh, more about uh, where the Quest Car Run will take place and, you know, how people can be part uh, 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 part of it if they wish to but we'll come back to that one also uh, i mean in terms of financial donations towards uh, uh, the course uh, how can people donate and for those who may be wary or concerned how do you go about showing that uh, the funds are allocated to the relevant people in need sorry i just broke up so, um, well i think you you asked me how can people you know, make a contribution. Is that that I hear you correctly? Sorry, apologies for that. Yes, I was just um, saying, how can people make a contribution to the project itself? Well, I think that the, look, this, the 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 sky and the, the KV sky uh, is 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 the vessel, but the 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 Edgenova is the is the actual is the actual um, the actual party that does that does this you know does the, the the good work so we just provide the ship and then they actually sail the ship um in in this regard so i think the best way would be is to go into the edgenova website as a non-profit um organization and it's simple it's www.edunova edunova.org and they can make contact with john Tolley. he's the founder and director thereof um and there is there's a multitude of ways that people can get involved and the other way people can get involved is to contact these guys and maybe if they want to enter the run and, and um, mm. take on this the super tough challenge by you know entering through one of the the, the donated in edgenova entries that will make a contribution direct contribution to this to this project adrian much appreciated for joining us uh, that was very insightful thanks for coming in
I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you so much. Edwin Sefi there, the Executive Director at Quayske Run, speaking to us about the work they do alongside EduNever to assist in educating underprivileged children. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we wrap up the conversation with an education expert. Welcome back uh, to Soweto Today. Much appreciated for joining us. My name is Tabo Mulugwane. As we wrap up uh, the show this evening, I want us to reflect on the state of education, both basic and higher education, uh, for the eight years later since the 1976 uprising. Let's take a listen. In South Africa, education is both a beacon of hope and a battleground for progress. With the legacy of apartheid and ongoing socio-economic challenges, the nation grapples with disparities in access, quality, and outcomes in its education system. Overcrowded classrooms and under-resourced schools remain pervasive issues, hindering effective teaching and learning. In rural areas, access to quality education is a daily struggle. Limited resources, including textbooks and technology, often hamper our ability to provide the best education for our students. In the same breath, the Minister of Education, Njimu Tsekha, welcomed the passing of the Bella Bill and has expressed gratitude to all stakeholders who have diligently worked to expedite the transformation of the basic education system. The Bella Bill is a necessary piece of legislative reform that will align the current South African Schools Act 84 of 1996 with developments in the education sector and case law coming from our courts. Very grateful and appreciative of the people who helped us to go this far. It's been long in the making, almost 10 years. And some of the, actually most of the clauses that we needed them. We needed the clauses that regulate admissions, we needed the clauses that help us in terms of age of admission, language policies. We really, even more important also, regulating grade R as part of basic education. So we really needed that bill to go through. And I'm very happy, I'm very relieved, but I'm also very grateful to the parliamentary processes, which was very exhaustive, uh, NCOP, and also the public that came to participate and engage on the bill. So I'm really happy, very relieved, as I say. I'm also very grateful to all the people who assisted us to go this far. In addition, access to higher education is a cornerstone of societal progress, offering individuals the opportunity to pursue their aspirations and contribute to the growth and development of their communities. However, for many South Africans, the dream of attaining a tertiary education is hindered by financial constraints. The other one that we do have in the country, the biggest one, is the space. So we don't have space. So there are a lot of people that are applying at these higher learning institutions. Uh, so last year, specifically, we had about 4 million applications that went through to 26 of our public institutions for only 162,000 spaces. So then that tells you that there is space uh, constraints that we have in the country. Recognizing this barrier, the National Student Financial Aid Scheme stands as a beacon of hope, providing crucial financial assistance to eligible students across the country. Nesfos has faced several challenges in recent years, including funding constraints, administrative inefficiencies, and issues with disbursement and repayment. Another issue that has plagued Nesfos is administrative inefficiencies, which have led to delays in the disbursement of funds and administrative errors in processing applications. To ensure the continued functioning of the National Student Financial Aid Scheme and even improve it, our decision to communicate in this manner is informed by a number of considerations. As minister, I have a deep appreciation for the progressive and transformative role that NESFAS has played over the 33 years of its existence. Flowing from this, I am also sensitive to the public expectation on NESFAS as it relates to its role in enabling poor and working class families to give their sons and daughters the gift of education. Through various formal engagements, as minister, I have consistently raised my concerns and unhappiness with the outgone NESFAS board about it, the inability or failure of NESFAS to carry out and implement some of its basic responsibilities that I have allocated to it. 
in terms of the act. The inability relates to the following. Inability to fully implement the recommendations of the Veltzman's report, key among which was the termination of the contracts of the direct payment service pro providers, which according to this report, the Veltzman's report, were appointed irregularly. I must say I raised this in December that steps must be taken to remove these service providers. Now these delays can disrupt students' academic progress and exacerbate financial hardships. Let's take a listen on this conversation between Soweto TV reporter Tabo Molokwane and Tswane University of Technology former SCR president Kiamokhetsu Masike. These are some of the things that we've always you know, called upon for, that government must make initiatives that would seek to open gates of higher learning to black students because mm -hmm. these are the very same black students that come from a uh, poor uh, 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 of the poorest uh, backgrounds communities villages and rural areas in this country and we've always preserved that it is important that government must always make sure that uh, access to education is accessible to these to these kind of students so of course the mm -hmm. pronouncement that you are then referring to uh, we 60 percent and it, it, it's good uh, that uh, you know we ought to have such uh, measures put in place to make sure that uh, you know funding is always available to the eligible and who are these eligible students these are the students that are passing in institutions of higher learning because i must also state it categorically clear that we are the biggest proponent of excess and success and anything that seeks to speak to academic excellence we will always uh, 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 give it our utmost support so if the, the minister says that average is 60 percent for you to be eligible for funding it is good because it encourages our students to stop sleeping in in, in their residences watching netflix and TikTok. but it also encourages them that they must go to their books and study such that in the next academic year, they are given a, a, a funding. Despite these challenges, Nestros remains a critical instrument for promoting access to higher education and addressing inequalities in South Africa. In conclusion, increasing government investment in education infrastructure, privatizing teacher training, and reforming the curriculum to align with market demands, additionally emphasizing early childhood education and ensuring inclusivity for learners with special needs are crucial aspects of building a more equitable and effective education system. By implementing these solutions, South Africa can move towards a future where every child has access to quality education and the opportunity to thrive. Many thanks to my colleagues there at uh, Soweto TV News uh, for compiling that insert uh, for us, highlighting some of the challenges that uh, young people are facing in this country, particularly in the uh, higher education sector, and also some of the challenges that are being faced in the basic education centers, uh, I mean, basic education sector, and also looking at uh, some of the initiatives that are being brought forward to assist uh, you know, our young people so that they can elevate them uh, to successful careers. They're much appreciated for that. Thank you to my earlier guests uh, from uh, tonight. That's Nato Silibi from the South African Actuarial Science Development Program, as well as Adrian Safi from the Quay Sky Run, uh, you know, for just uh, sharing their insights on some of the programs that they are running there. That's how we wrap up today's episode of Soweto Today. Remember, we love hearing from you, so please feel free to talk to us about this episode, simply send us an email. It's Soweto today at SowetoTV.co.za or you can call or WhatsApp us at 081-531-8857. Hi, it's Uri Dirile Hulikane from myself, Tabo Mulukwani, and the rest of the team. It's good night from us and thank you for watching. But stay tuned for the latest news update coming up next with Preeti Ngwenya.